you. Um, obviously, it's a great pleasure to have you here, and thanks for coming. Obviously, we've got members of our media. So we have um, Hannah Gautreau from Shortlist, uh, Leslie Horsburgh from McCrib International. <laughs> got it right this time. Alex from Sahara of IT, yeah, and it's me. And you're going to be joining us as well. Around the table, we do have um, some representatives from IPR. We've got um, Eleanor Sampson, <laughs> and we've also got Aidan McLaughlin here as well. Um, joining us on the panel today, we've got Chris Holmes and Karen Evans and uh, Guy Vandenbroek. Good. And uh, we also have Mary Ellen Dugan, who's our Vice President of Corporate Marketing here as well today. So the format's going to be very simple, really. It's a conversation. And it's a conversation to really kind of stimulate some thoughts around a few areas of improvement in HR today. Um, I will kick us off with a few questions in a few moments. Um, but generally speaking, you know, I want interaction between everybody. It's not like a Q&A session just with the panellists. If you guys have got stuff to say, um, do absolutely say it. That's really important to us. If you don't hear from me too much, it's probably a good thing. The conversation's going well. Um, but I'll definitely keep us on track and steer us towards um, a good session. Um, lunch is going to be served and it's going to be a companion style lunch, so there's no other cart to worry about. They'll just bring some food and you guys just eat it and enjoy it. Please, <laughs> um, I hear it's amazing. Um, so I think without further ado, um, if we could just do a quick introduction from, from the panellists today, mm -hmm. um, that would be a good start. Can we start with you, Doc? Yep, um, my name's Diane Vanderbilt and I work at Workable Industrial Studies in Sydney in the Business School. I teach human resource management at an undergraduate and postgraduate level and I research in skills migration and other sort of things I study recruitment um, and a few other things that you can learn about that or not about that in where the conversation goes. Just hope we cover some of that. <laughs> um, in terms of um, specific skill sets, you, you work a lot in terms of the global migration research group as well. Mm -hmm. So you've got some exposure to that, I think we're going to cover some of that today yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm Karen Evans. I'm the Managing Director of NGA.net in the Asia Pacific region. Um, NGA.net is a talent management software provider and we have offices here. We're Australian uh, founded back in 1997 but uh, penetrated the US Fed market in 2010. So very specialist in government, education, healthcare. Uh, today obviously we have recruitment software so today I guess is going to focus on that. Uh, but we do spread more broadly than that into talent management. So I think there'll be some opportunity to talk a little bit more broadly outside of just straight external recruitment. Great. Okay, good. Chris. Um, Chris Himes. I am the uh, Senior Vice President of Product and International Indeed, so I'm responsible for technology as well as for international expansion. Uh, I've been with Indeed for a little over four years now. The company is this month celebrating our 10 year anniversary. So small part of Indeed history, but four years ago when I joined, we were about 140 people with two offices, and now over 1,200 people with 15 offices, I think in 11 countries, and so a lot has happened in the last four years. Oh, that's great. Uh, a lot of recruitment, a lot of hiring, a lot of wide work. We have sites in 55 countries and 28 languages, and while well, we're not number one in Australia yet, uh, we are the number one job site in the world. Excellent, thanks Chris. So there were kind of three areas that we kind of want to cover today and we'll see how it goes. It, it, it can be quite organic and uh, as I said, I'll keep it on track. The first one we want to look at is really the kind of current state of affairs in recruitment today. We'll then take a look at more about the job seeker, particularly those that are maybe a bit less direction than others, the more direction is job seekers and how you know we can certainly as the industry you know, really take advantage of that and really help people get those jobs. And the third one's going to be about you know, actionable insights. And, and some of that stuff, the stuff you know, Dice mentioned, um, certainly you know, the data as, as well as other behaviours as well, that we can start to understand better to do great. Okay? So in terms of a broad starter for everybody really, I think we'll, we'll start with the panel and any one of you can take that. You know, what would you define today as success in HR or recruitment or HR and recruitment? It's a biggie. Well, it depends on what level you're looking at. I mean, if I would just kick off with the sort of individual level, success would look like both parties sort of achieving their goals, which is the applicant, you know, getting the job, the, the job that they want to be in the yeah. organisation, you know, so getting some sort of mutual win, win out of that situation would be at a micro level. So, how does that look for you on the yeah, and, and I think um, for us we're, we're doing a lot of focus in this space, I think, 
for us, it's more broadly has to be about your people. So organisations must understand what they have in their workforce. And success for me, which I think is an advantage, is that you would understand what you have in your workforce, what you're going to need, where your gaps are, what you can improve by succession. And I think an organisation that could nail that would be so far ahead of the game. Okay, so in terms of enablement to really kind of fill that gap that you talked about, yep. how is that? How do you see that kind of working? Yeah, it's, it's, I'm going to jump to your end game here because it's okay. all about the data. All right, let's look at that a bit later. Yep. That's great. Yep. So we'll start with some Chris, what would you like to add? Uh, sorry, mate. Thanks. 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 Cool. Actually, Greg's just joined. Oh, you're not that late, actually, mate. No, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Yes. So Greg's this insider. So um, we just asked the first question to the guys actually just played with the panel. It's around kind of you know how we, are we defining success in HR recruitment today? Um, and I think it's Chris. Great. Uh, our mission as a company is pretty simple. It's uh, on business cards that I've handed out to some of you. We help people get jobs. And so our definition of success is a job seeker or employer finding the connection with that person handing out employee. For us, the challenge, and we'll obviously talk throughout the rest of the, the lunch about it, but bunch of different factors in that is that we are a broad and not specialized site so indeed is comprehensive we have all kinds of jobs from truck drivers to CFOs and everything in between and so we try to do this in a very simple and unified way but solving those problems for different types of employment different types of job seekers and different types of employers and making it look easy um, is, a, is a big challenge okay so in terms of the process itself you know, job seekers have got different needs. And how do you think job seeker behavior has changed over the last kind of few years? And this could be a good one for you as well, Ty. In terms of their needs, when they're looking for that perfect job, that career change, that next step, what sort of things do you think are the key drivers in terms of not just the behaviors, but in terms of their kind of actually must-haves when it comes to kind of looking for that role or deciding upon which role to take? Yeah, I'm not sure you would generalize on that. I mean, it would depend on the age group, the life sort of stage of the applicant, mm -hmm. so many things that, that are, you know, I think a lot of a lot of applicants sort of don't really know what sort of job is their dream job. They don't really know what their skills are. I mean, yeah. there's so many questions I've got back here about why don't organisations do skills in their organisation? Yeah. Why don't they do that? Yeah. And then the other point would be, well, okay, getting the person the job, is it the job? Is it the job that that person actually really wants? Do they have, you know, there's so many complications around it's not just about getting a job, it's about getting a job that's going to retain them. Because I've got the organisation to be back in the same position in a year, which is pretty good for you. So, great for that. so you're, you're an educational <laughs> professor, so in terms of you must see quite diverse, quite diverse groups that, that kind of you know, come through your, your day to day, week to week. Do you see any common trends? In, you mentioned you know, that they, they, they don't quite know what they're looking for. Yeah. Is that particularly. But even with, with my students, day? you know, I, t I teach students that might be in their 40s or doing a career change or they might be in their 20, but it's really different types of students and they're all looking for different things. Mm -hmm. um, they all have different skill sets, they all got different awareness about what they sort of want. So you can't, you just can't generalise about those things. Most people want opportunities. They want yeah. a career, they don't want a job, they want a career. And they want opportunities in a job that will build them a career. So I suppose, I know it's a sort of wishy-washy answer, but it's pretty well the way I see it. Well, I don't think it's wishy-washy, I think in terms of you know, making that happen though, you know, yeah. are they doing stuff different today than they maybe were three or four years ago? Well, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know. But it, yeah, the news has been there for say 10, more than 10 okay. years now, we're supposed to be in You know, okay. one of the interesting things is Whirlpool. Yeah. Um, you know, where yeah. I just marked an honest thesis, which is on Deloitte Whirlpool, and what that site ends up doing is actually, ostensibly, it's for graduates to get a job, you know, people go through an internship. What, what it really what really happens if you look at the forum posts is they end up talking to each other about what it's like to work for, what, what the process you have to go through, the job there is. It's like knowledge sharing that you're doing. So they're doing a lot of talking back and forth these recruits. Sort of like a trip advisor now. You know, don't go to that hotel, they've got a really crappy or noisy. You know. So that sort of stuff in the recruitment space is fascinating how they're all helping each other and building that knowledge about where is a good place to work. Yeah. So word of mouth is big. That's good. So, I mean, Chris, you would certainly have some insights into that kind of the social reviewing, sharing, you know, you know, the validation that job seekers may be looking for perhaps today that maybe wasn't available in the same sort of mass, you know, environment as it is now. 
how have you seen things change during your time in technology? Yeah, that is a, a big shift, and we like to talk about that in, in Austin, Texas. Um, something that's very important to people there is tacos, right? There are 475 taco places in Austin, and no one would think of going to get a taco for breakfast without looking up the reviews. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on these sites. And yet, until very recently, there was no place for something as significant in your life as a job that you could go and actually find out what it's like to work at an individual company. So there have been a proliferation over the last couple of years of, of companies doing that. We started to recognize job seekers' desire for that, and so we introduced uh, a little over uh, three years ago the ability for job seekers to provide ratings and reviews of their places of work. Um, indeed, is now a I'll try to refrain from throwing around number one a lot, but just to sort of put scale to it, we're the, actually the number one destination uh, and source of employer reviews in the world right now. With over six million uh, reviews from job seekers all over the world. And that is something that not only are people interested in sharing that information, but it's becoming a very important part of looking for jobs. And so people expect when they're looking for something, they can also do research at the same time. Yeah. And what we see is that the engagement in terms of what people are doing changes over time. So people will come to the site first and over, say, a three to six month job search, they'll start by looking at a bunch of different jobs, try to figure out what might be a good fit for them. Mm -hmm. Then they'll eventually, we have a, a, a feature on the site where a job seeker can basically save a search, put in their email address, and then we'll run that search for them every day. And every every 24 hours, the new jobs that have been posted in the last 24 hours will send them an email summary. Uh, that one feature alone, we have essentially more people engaging with Indeed every day from opening those emails than coming to our site or, or visiting yeah. our, our mobile app. And we have a significant number of people on both. Um, and then once they get farther along and they start looking at jobs and applying to them, that's when they actually get into the research phase and they're going to try to understand the differences. Not just do people like this place, but do people who work in a similar role do you like this place in this particular location. We also break things down by uh, what is the culture like, what is the work-life balance, uh, what is the compensation like, and you can actually see that there are different people who are motivated by different factors, and that's where getting down to, is this a good fit for me? Mm -hmm. um, however, there's also multiple different areas of the economy, and there's a, a group of people for whom those kinds of questions they have the luxury of asking, and then there's a whole bunch of other people who've been looking for a job for six months, mm -hmm. 12 months, 18 months, where the other trend we see is, as opposed to getting more and more specific and being choosy, there's a lot of people who start with a very specific search. I'm looking for a role that pays this with these types of skills within a five kilometer radius of this location. And over time, if they're not finding work, they'll start to look in broader locations. They'll start to look anywhere. Um, and actually, this is uh, one of the sobering things, one of the most common searches on Indeed is a search for location with no specific job title, no skills at all. I'm just looking what you have here. Is that across internationally or particular time? Worldwide, that is the single most common yeah. search that we have, which makes sense. And it's, it's different in, in different markets, but it's, uh, it's a, a very, it's again, a sobering percentage of searches. And that can happen for any number of reasons. It could be someone who's just gotten out of high school, maybe not going to school, taking time off or not going to school at all, and they don't know what they're qualified for. Someone who's just graduated who might not be going and following what their undergraduate studies mm -hmm. were or someone who's 55 and the industry that they're in is no longer available. And so for us, this is kind of getting to some of the future questions I suspect we'll be jumping around a bit, but solving the problem of helping to understand what people might be suited for when they don't know what they're looking for, that's actually the most interesting challenge we're working on. As a search engine, we're very good if you know you're looking for this particular job, we can find that, but helping people by looking at what they've searched for in the past, what are the jobs they've applied for, what people who are like them. So if we're applying kind of the same data science techniques that companies like Amazon do to understand giving all of this data, if someone has searched for and applied for these types of jobs, what other jobs might be a good fit for them, and also looking at the history of their resume so you can figure out people who have this kind of background and these sets of skills, what positions that they might not be looking for potentially mm -hmm. a good fit. So when does the money kick in? Do you subscribe to Big Alerts or? In terms of how does Indeed make money? Yeah. So we have, there's worldwide about 16 million jobs on the site. Um, we, uh, we're a search engine, so we're, we're very much like Google. There's about 200,000 sites around the world that we get jobs from every day. Um, we don't charge to get jobs on the site. We never charge job seekers for anything. For employers who are looking to hire in, say, a competitive market or a competitive position, 
for example, in New York City, there's 59,000 sales positions. So if you're trying to hire a salesperson in New York City, you probably need to promote your job a little extra. So we have a sponsored uh, job product where employers can spend additional money. It's unlike job, traditional job boards, it's a uh, paper performance model. So it's like they set a budget and a maximum cost per click. We show all the jobs. If someone clicks on that job, they can adjust for that click. One of the arguments, not looking for a job, I haven't been looking at job sites very often. And um, you're talking about how you've got the ratings for the employees. And you know, obviously, when you say it, no ratings, it's like a triple. But uh, are other sites doing that? Is it something you're doing yourselves? When did you start doing that? Uh, we started doing it about three years ago. Uh, there's one other site in the U.S. that has been doing it for a while, that's called Glassdoor. Um, but that's, those were sort of the two prior lines that were. And is that active in Australia? It's active in Australia. Is there any other job site doing it? Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar. Really um, we're locally here. Yeah. Um, n nothing of that, of, of, of that substantial size. I think the job advances, if you're a local star, if you do something similar, they're much more, much more small. Clearly, I mean, you could really afford to do something. Yeah, and which is a strength. Yeah, part of it comes from we basically, when job seekers upload their resume, at that point we know the current company they're working at, the previous company, so we can just ask them at that point to tell us what it looks like to work with this company. Is there a box to say the Yeah, so they're, they're just public, so they don't have to share them. It's just an optional thing, but it's essentially help other job seekers learn what it's like to. Yeah, so the, the trick there is that those are things that um, I, I would describe as part of a mismatch between how employers talk and what job seekers are looking for. Uh, we get, of the 16 million jobs on the site, those job descriptions are essentially what we have to work with. Um, now we do have this additional data that job seekers start to tell us about these companies, so we learn from those reviews, frankly, more than anything else. But job postings tend to be extremely dry. Uh, companies, we spend our, our client services team spends a lot of time working with companies where I'm sure you see the same thing. And government must be actually far worse, where the job, <laughs> job titles are these internal, you know, in administrator for, as which is not a job title that anyone's searching for. Nobody knows what, what these things mean. And so humanizing stuff becomes very important. On the search side, there's a lot that we can do, where we have um, basically, again, looking at the data. We see that people who search for multiple different terms when the jobs come back, which are the ones that they actually click on, so which are the ones that are good fit. And we've sort of developed this internal set of synonyms. So when people use a set of terms, these all kind of mean the same thing. Some of those are things that we do on a local basis, country by country. So we have a, a large team sitting in Austin of our country <coughs> managers. They're essentially the quarterback for each of our individual countries. And they help understand where in different languages you have gender issues. So when you're searching for, say, in France, uh, one deuce and one door is the male and female version of salesperson. Uh, job titles typically are almost always the male version, but you have people coming in and searching for both, so we have to be able to recognize those. When we do those in the international languages, then we can also do those in the US and in other English speaking countries when someone's searching for a Chinese <coughs> council job should match. A, a big part of making search relevant is understanding that mapping from intent to these dry descriptions of employers. We don't expect employers to fix the problem on their end, so we feel like we have to do it by looking at the data, looking at what people are searching for, looking at jobs are matching, which ones are not matching, and trying to understand better the job seekers are looking for. Okay, can I bring Karen into this as well? <coughs> Clearly, um, your your international business now as well, so you work yeah. in multiple markets also. In terms of the job composition, job content, and the needs of the advertisers, I guess, your customers, who are looking at you, you may 
do you think there's been enough focus uh, in terms of how they um, of how they use that content to drive you know their advertising or their the goals for best job seekers? I, I think there's a real wish to do so. I think what gets in the way, particularly for some of our sectors like education, where there's the it is such a I hate to use the term water for talent, but it just is. And I think it becomes very difficult in that wish to make it interesting and attractive versus here's what the role actually is and here's what we cannot compromise on. Which, flipping it from the job seeker to the internal side of things, I think the real challenge is in not compromising to make sure you get what you actually need. Which for the job seeker means some clarity around this is the job that I'm actually applying for and this is what I will be doing when I get to that. Organization. So is it fair to say in many cases <clears throat> some of your customers or any other customers that you have rated as revenue technology companies are writing the job for the company as opposed to writing the job for the job seeker, what they're looking for? Would that be fair to say? No, I, d I don't think so. I think they're really, they're trying very hard to write an ad that is attractive. Mm -hmm. But I think what becomes very difficult then is how do I make it attractive but also then spell out what the job actually is? So, great innovations, person required for that. Exactly right. <laughs> right. So, so great culture job, and, and you know, great teamwork and yeah. great benefits and, you know, it, it's interesting. Do you often get a lot of internal kind of Germanism within the job ads themselves? So, an example, like I went and saw a very large global um, pharmaceutical company recently and they were looking for um, essentially people to go and sell to GPs and they were and the job titles were nothing like and then they could be nothing further from you know a job title that someone would be looking for if they were looking to do a sales job in the pharmaceutical industry. And yet there was such an enormous resistance for that organisation to change because that's what the US wanted and that's what they were told to do and that's just the way they were. Do you see much agility from these organisations in terms of you know the fact they are starting to recognise that they have a problem and they're looking to maybe change that? I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure, do they know they've got a problem? Well, the electricians are they? Rather than getting the great candidates, or not, of this reason, they're not getting the right candidates. And, and I think yeah. that's the point, again, and I'm, I'm going to be like a broken record, but that, it has to be back to that data. If you're not looking at how successful your strategies are, then how do you know what you're doing? And then, I guess you drill in and say, well, is it the content of the ad? Is it the title of the ad? Is it where I'm posting my vacancies? all of those things, but I think without getting down to the data and removing that gut feel element or a corporate dictate that you can't navigate around because you don't have the proof to say, this is not what we should be doing. Mm. I remember in the 90s when Optus entered the market and they were really pushing this, you know, this is the most exciting company to work for, forget about the old dad and tell mm -hmm. you know, this is really dynamic and attracted a whole bunch of really, really sort of um, High class graduate class in New South Wales Uni at the time, a lot of my students were rushing off rockets, you know, and the money wasn't too bad, but there was just, it was just, they were getting this really high attrition because these kids were getting bored. Mm -hmm. it, it actually was a call center job, literally, mm -hmm. and they realized that they were actually advertising the wrong way. You know, they were attracting the wrong person and they were getting high turnover and then they changed the, the pitch. It's actually not as dynamic as you might have made out when you first entered the market. It would be interesting though, Martin. Talk more about social media because actually it's the next thing I want to talk about. Oh, but two, 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 things that, two things that are dear to my heart, maybe mostly more dear mobile, maybe secondly social. But I think certainly um, there are two areas which you know I think are having an impact on the privilege today. I'm really I think everyone wants to sit and hear your views on how much of an impact they're having. And you know, I think maybe we'll start with social first. Um, how is it changing stuff um, in terms of the job seeker? I'm going to talk about I'm going to keep talking internally, I can't 
talk about it from the That's business fine. side but of the right so you know, right. And I'll talk just NGA for a minute. I, I, um, no disrespect, but I will choose to post on LinkedIn every time. Uh -huh. If I, and, and that doesn't mean that's, that's the only place, but we're doing a lot of proactive searching on LinkedIn, which is effectively social media for business anyway, and having some real success in that. And I think that for me is really important and our clients, depending, it's, it's more difficult for the government to, to go social, it, it just is, but I think, you know, our clients are certainly jumping on the social bandwagon far more than that. Why are they feeling, because of the CV and the networks of the social you can see? I've just, i found, what I've found personally is I can post a job, page staff does it for me, post a job that will return um, people that look like what I'm looking for and then I can find more people like you yeah, that. But then it works as well. And also being able to go into a company that, that you know does, I'm looking for um, business intelligence uh, consultant at the moment to help our customers with the data and being able to look at companies that do that well from a consultancy mm -hmm. and then say who used to work there, where are they now and, and tapping in to those people and then you know having copies and, and doing that. Okay, so that's a very strategic approach that you're taking for your business. Yeah. <coughs> in terms of that, that's sort of your customers yeah. as well, which you've got. How many customers do you guys have? Just under 200. 200. I mean, how, I guess, have they adopted the social media and how have they changed as well? Yeah. I, I think it's fair to say that there is still a lot of post and pray on a lot. And post and pray, but you mean advertising on your boards? And I, you would, just... I, and I do, and, I, and probably, you know, advertising on the seat, I think is still a very, um, a view of, well, I have to because I might just miss someone if I don't, versus the social side of things, which is getting more and more traction, but not as much as you might expect. I think it's getting there, but it hasn't been, in our sectors, it hasn't been as, it's taken longer than we Okay, a direct question then. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you have any customers who are hiring direct through, for example, Facebook? Uh, and actually making hires that you know. Uh, not Australia. through Facebook, but certainly through LinkedIn. So would that kind of like across the age sectors or groups, yeah? Um, well, I guess it's, I mean, I don't know, I, sh I shouldn't say yes, I don't know. I don't know um, what the demographics are who is on there, but I've certainly seen candidates myself mm. from a full age range. LinkedIn today, at least the way that they talk about themselves when they're promoting themselves to employers and advertisers, they specialize in professionals yeah. who are in advanced or managerial roles. And so they tend to be very good if you're looking for people who are in the $100,000 plus range and they have a, a lot of them. Um, that represents a, a small sector of the hiring world, so companies can use them very effectively for management and above hiring. They can't use them for all of their activities. So I guess from the job seeker perspective, one of the things that we've seen from social is that um, there's a huge interest from employers. Everyone feels like it needs to be a part of their strategy. This is kind of, it feels like 1996 over all, you know, all over again when everyone had to be on the web. Um, and so it's, a, it's an important part of everyone's strategy in terms of what we're seeing, we have done, so as an as a organization that uses data and experimentation to make a lot of our decisions, um, we have tried multiple different things to engage job seekers in various social channels just to see what the interest is. And what we've found is that for a lot of people, uh, looking for a job is not a social activity. Uh, there are a couple aspects where having connections becomes important. One is if you're applying for a job at a company and you happen to know someone there, making sure that a hiring manager can actually see your resume. So there is one point um, there where it becomes important. Um, and then the other is when you're looking for references, so be able to find out you know, who might work at this person so you can check them. But what we've seen is when you have someone who's been looking for a job for six months, they're not necessarily going to be on Facebook and posting every day, hey, I just applied to 25 more jobs and I'm expecting 24 of them. That's, it's a much more private thing where, where the most social activity actually happens is when someone gets hired, the celebration of the yeah. hey, I found it, and the congratulations there. But um, I think it's inevitable that people will 
sort of use more and more those connections. But right now, we see a huge mismatch between what employers think the promise is and what job seekers are actually doing today. Mm -hmm. It's funny, this, this analysis of uh, Whirlpool's I don't know if you've come across this term gamification, where it's like set up by the game. So recruits sort of allegedly go through this process where they're playing the game. Now, my argument is that it's not really a game, it's not really a game. I'm serious in that. But it seems to be maybe some way employers sort of try to pick it that way to the sort of, you know, the younger generation about this is a sort of an exciting thing to do and they'll sit and do this exercise and go to the next stage. And all these, as I say, all these graduates are talking to each other about, oh, did you see how hard that test was and how did you go on that one? It wasn't just celebration of the people who got the jobs, it was also, man, that was just awful, I'm not going back. You know, there's that as well, negative, positive, negative. So it's, it's, a, it's a sort of like a, a gamble, isn't it? Because these kids should be too honest with each other about what they think about this particular organisation. And I was like, well, they're good and bad. Yeah, yeah so beware. Yeah. And, I, and I know Deloitte, for example, did look at the site and did put you in the down in the comments, but you know, I think it's going to be a separate bigger thing where if you just do start swapping tools, then it's all about what's going on within the organisation and the other recruitment process. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, I guess the kind of second part of, of what I wanted to talk about on that kind of area was mobile, which we kind of touched on social. I think, you know, mobile is in itself a massive topic, it could be a big one right now. I think it's clear that mobile adoption is growing. It's clear that Australia very much leads the way um, in, in, against many markets in terms of usage for mobile. And penetration is very, very, very large, you know, even compared to the US, right? It's ahead of the US market, which is, which is really remarkable. In terms of the changing behaviours uh, because of mobile, what have you seen? And I guess I'm really interested to hear not just your insights, but also you know, really kind of getting you to think about how mobile money looks in 12 months time perhaps, even three years time, what does the world look like? Well, from our customer's point of view, you have to be able to access technology on the You just have to. So, and I'm sure that extends to the job seeker as well, right? There's, even personally, you don't go anywhere without your phone. You just don't, and you, you expect to be able to do everything. It's an interesting question about what's next. I, 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 I grapple with that a bit. I think what, for me, not to divert away from your question too far, I think it's going to be more, what is the job market going to do in three, five years time? And I, I think that would be interesting as the millennials start growing a little bit older and they need to be working from home, doing jobs that don't cement them in their careers, I, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens in the contingent labour market as we get into the future. So we kind of touched on contingent workforce, which I think is a good topic to talk about in a minute as well, because that's, that's one that comes up a lot yep. right now. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on mobile, Chris, in terms of you know what you're seeing? I think uh, you get a lot of information and data from around the world. Try if you can to focus on Australia, our local marketplace here. Where do you kind of think mobile's at in terms of you know, as, as a job seeking tool, but also from the employer side as well, we need to look at that side too. You know, how do you think it's going to be changing um, things moving forwards, you know, for, for good and so what problems might it present as well? Yeah, so I think um, as, as Chris mentioned, mobile here in Australia today is about 54% of all searches on the are from a mobile device. And that's up just in the last three years from about 14%. So uh, well, that, that's Australia. Globally, we're at 50%. So Australia is, is almost 10% ahead of the global average, although it's very different in different markets. So in South American markets, it might be 20%. In Korea, it's 85%. Um, we look, frankly, when we're, when we're looking at the future, we look we look to the east, first of all, and we look at, at Japan, 75%, Korea, 85%, and then also at younger generations. So when we look at people in the 18 to 35 range, they're twice as likely to have a mobile device as their primary form of internet connection. And so those are people who think about what the market's going to be like 10 or 20 years. People are not going to be sitting at desktop mm -hmm. computers. Um, how it's changed the way that people look, and I, I think it's very similar in terms of what mobile has done in a lot of different markets, is that it's just introduced the sort of uh, notion of immediacy. Um, so we always have, we talked about job alerts and people wanting to see jobs when they've been posted in the last 24 hours when they're on a mobile device, you can see jobs that are posted. Seven minutes, and so we are constantly seeing people. The percentage.
percentage of jobs that people apply to on a mobile device uh, that were posted in the last six hours is double what it is on a desktop, which is not surprising. So people are on their commute when they're at lunch, when they're at a coffee shop. That essentially what it's done is it's taken the job search process and made it a 24-hour thing. Lock everything else back in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and where I think it becomes interesting on both sides is depending on what market you're in um, and depending on what job category, if it's one where it's extremely competitive for job seekers, mm -hmm. then you see job seekers using mobile and incredible amount because they want to get their application in within you know, the first 10 people who apply to a job when it's a, a market where it's a, a war for, for talent on the other side of high tech and, and nursing and some other fields like that, then you see employers doing the same thing where they're looking for wanting to, we have the same uh, same product for employers, but the opposite one, and someone creates a, a resume, you can, an employer can sign up for resume alerts, and so they can say, I'm looking for someone with these skills in this particular area, and as soon as those get posted, we send an email, and you see them contacting people within the hours of when this website. So that's what's really fun. So yeah, mobile just basically <coughs> takes it from being something where the, uh, you can wait to, it's the, sort of the, how quickly you can respond, because yeah. really it's important to, to get yeah. Right. Yeah, so the biggest challenge though is that um, one of the problems is that a lot of the, the talent management software that people are using, they can't actually apply to a job in the right place. And so because most people don't have their resume sitting on their phone, yeah. this is when we look at uh, Apple Pay and PayPal and these other things, what happened is people had to create systems where consumers could get their credit card in the account so that you didn't have to pay out of the job. Purchasing. So for us, that meant creating an online resume that job seekers could have and working with employers to enable so they can actually get an application. Right now, if 55% of the searches are coming from a mobile device and more than 90% of the jobs in Australia today can't be applied to a mobile device, there's a big mismatch. Especially if a job gets posted, I want to apply to that. So that's something that we've spent a lot of time on. How many people are using the that's another uh, interesting question. Um, well, so the funny thing is they haven't really changed yeah. at all yeah. in 70 years, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other funny thing though is that with LinkedIn, which is very close to your resume, we still see recruiters, when they find someone on LinkedIn, their first message is, can you send me a resume? Because, really? because, the, because the resume is slightly different. But, um, where, where the resume is interesting, I don't think it's beautiful. <laughs> Where we find the resume really valuable is that it, it contains a collection of information mm -hmm. and the job seeker doesn't know what part of it is the most important or most relevant, yeah, but there's something in there. So one of the examples that I like to use is back for those of you that were around in, when Y2K was happening. Um, there was this sudden huge need in the tech world for COBOL programs. This is an ancient programming language that no one had used in 30 years, but all of these old systems that had to be updated when the world was going to come to an end with Y2K to get this bug, suddenly these people who had somewhere buried in their resume this, this skill that nobody knew was important were in incredibly high demand. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that what we have seen is that there are, there's a mismatch between when employers suddenly decide a new skill is important and the job seekers realize that they have something that's relevant. Yeah. So that's where again, having all of that data, I hope they don't go away too soon or something yeah. uh, like that, where yeah. having that work history is really important yeah. to understand what you might be qualified for that you might already know about. Yeah. I suppose it's not the applicant to understand what the, what the product the employer wants and shake their resume. Because it's not, it's not only I'm born in the line, like that you are a narrative about it, so you pitch it to the organization, what should we do in this case? Right. The CV is still important, but it's a very different beast from what it was 10 years ago. I think it's much more around storytelling about what you're talking to yourself, as a person who's going to be a leader. And it really is a kind of first line filtering. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's, that's the wrong narrative. <laughs> right. and, I think, and, and maybe that's the one thing that's consistent, because I think it's kind of 15 years ago. Still, a does this person look like they have something? Yeah. 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 Then you this still have to bring that person in and talk to them. Right? Isn't the employer doing the dual search part of the resume? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's not easy. Not 
Oh, all right. And those tend to, to be more on the disqualifying side. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or drunken pictures yeah. or something that, that would make me feel like you're not a good fit. And it's very hard to do Google search to find the things that are helpful in terms of search. So, uh, Derek Schmidt, uh, when I see uh, Google and Frank Sherman said, you know, if you've done two bad things, you should um, just change your name. Which <laughs> <laughs> is kind of ridiculous, but then New Zealand, we can change your name. It's a mini, you know, new resume. That's the same thing. We have to look at that. No, it's not your name, it's just the site that's not your name, it's like backwards or something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I kind of want to give Chris a chance to have something to eat. So, particularly on the, on the kind of more technology leading journalists at the table, what are we kind of hearing in, in, in terms of technology and recruitment today? So I know you guys will cover it as a sector. What's kind of happening locally here in Australia, Jill? I think it depends on, from an agency perspective, which is becoming a lot more important, and it's becoming a Is that just because it's different than what they've always done? Yeah, I think so. Right. I mean, I've shown my age now, but you know, I worked in recruitment many years ago when we still used the cards mm. and getting onto the database and then just use our and all the consultants won't update it. But you know, <coughs> that was a big transition, so we can still use it. Oh, it's crazy, but right. you know, so I think um, there's a lag, and I think there's a real Dream of really exciting companies, and we spoke to one you know, earlier. And when you find those, they're like gold, and they think they're ahead, and they know what they're doing, and they're interested, and they're tuned in, and they're willing to make the same and take risks. Yeah. And then there's all the others that are out of time. And actually, that cue is very wonderful. So there's kind of three. Maybe three, maybe four things. You're talking about really <coughs> education is one, I guess, and mm -hmm. maybe diet can, can certainly add to that as well. I think you talked about trust as well. I mean, trust in terms of the technology as a platform, or trust in the vendors, or kind of all the above, all the above. And then I guess you know, do you think there's a fear there with that? You know, it is an orthodox market. They kind of do do what they've always done, and that's you know because of in many ways the vendors that are in front of them and, and, and the the recruitment advertising in particular landscape is there. Do you think they're just a little bit overly worried about what the world looks like and what they're doing today? Yeah, I think they're overwhelmed. So they're overwhelmed as well. Okay. Yeah. So how, how do you think that you know how do you think they can kind of take that leap? What do you think they need to help help make the decision for them? Um, I think you know human nature is, is you know, we're, we're tuned to believe what we see in the world we want to see somebody else and then we don't want to first and if they then you know fall apart then I might have a go to do it. So I think So the meter approach. Yeah. See see seeing someone else do it and seeing the impact that it's had and you know recruiters tend to work on books and um, you know that's what it's all about. So I think those kind of things are really important um the time for. So you know it's 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 breaking it down into well actually what it will all back to a business. Um, and I think those things are like I say, it's all education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at real life education, I should say, stuff. All organisations can't fill all applicants, and you just put you know, thinking about what can't just be I mean, education is always the sectors you deal with are specific sectors. 
So in the grad space, for example, mm -hmm. that continual fight every year against the big corporates who have a lot of money. Yeah, well, well I was going to say, you, you've got a wage to continue. Yeah. But yeah. you've got the work-life balance, which is the public sector has always been fantastic. Training, not bad, you know, so mm -hmm. there's other things. And there is, but I think it's, um, you know, I question work life balance in the public sector anymore. Yeah. Well, he's got work balance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's... Um, and I'm not so, mobile stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But there's certainly, you know, there are certainly benefits, but I think it's, you know, a young grad and we've got some sexy big... Well, it's like they're going to be throwing money at you. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. if, if the companies are having difficulty in uh, advertising their jobs correctly or being honest about what their work environment is, what sort of work are recruiters doing or job sites doing to educate these employers about how to advertise their jobs properly? I mean, most companies have enough trouble creating a product that people want to buy. They're not, they're not experts at, um, at recruitment. Yeah. And that's why they get recruiting companies. But by the same product, by the same token, what most companies sell is people now. They don't sell products like the phones you have. They're pretty indistinguishable companies. Yeah, but so I mean, you know, most, you know, most, most of the things you go into a store and buy are the physical items. They're not the people. It's the people that are making oh, them. The people that are selling them. The well, services, yeah. Services from government services or those sorts of things. You know, Deloitte's services or services. But, uh, indeed, it's not just advertising. You know, you've got every job there. Garbage people, printers, whatever. You know, probably not for the president. Well, companies, certainly, but not. Companies. You would have, you would have, you would have, you would have, you would have we'll probably get ended with better politicians if they went to a job site. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, they do say that, you know, politics is Hollywood primary people. So, it doesn't give me much confidence. It doesn't give me much confidence in the politics. Well, that's not original, of course. It's not the fact that that. But what, what are, Things we're talking about, you know, you were specifically saying how difficult it is for these companies to advertise correctly. Well, I mean, we've been around for a hundred years or something, and then we've got the run. The recruitment agencies and um, you have to work with a lot of these different companies. Well, it's really important. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
social element as well. And it's a big potpourri of stuff that is still involved. We have an entire team, the, our client services team, that's dedicated to just working with the videos to help them with their content. It must be growing and growing. They're, they're growing very quickly. We have in, uh, in our office here at Submix, we have, we have HR and marketing, but it's primarily sales and client services. <coughs> we can't read market that we're in. And how they work is different in every market. Um, in Japan, for example, uh, every online job site are responsible for writing job descriptions. Employers don't even write job descriptions at all. They consider it a marketing service that they're, that they're outsourcing. Um, sounds crazy. Which is, it sounds crazy, but it, it, it works. They actually have, in, in Japan, we see the, the, the lowest ratio of applications to hires in, in any market in the world. So there are four or five applications to the right. So obviously, whatever they're doing seems to be working in that market. <coughs> And, and what we see in, in different places, that a lot of it depends on the size of the company and the industry that they're in. Obviously, on the government side, you have so many regulations where you can't just have someone else write the job description. There's all these different things that you could do to stay compliant. We see a lot more, in general, uh, openness to new things and to experimentation in small businesses than in large businesses, because in general, you, know, you might have one, more you, you more might have one person who is running the company who's doing all the sales and doing all the marketing and hiring everyone. And they don't have time to, to try a whole bunch of different things, but they're willing to serially experiment with things and see what works. Where with larger companies, you tend to have um, more kind of established ways of doing things and it's harder to break out. But a lot of the companies that we see that are most successful, they actually have their online marketing team is in large part responsible for how they do online job posting, which is separate from how they do the more traditional does that lead with HR them, or are they still separate? They, they work together. So we, we had just had a, a collection of, uh, of some of our largest customers come and visit us in Austin last week. And uh, it was probably 60-40 you know, split between people who were pure HR and people who were marketing. But I mean, marketing has become an essential HR function. And what's the sort of you know, average kind of cost visually to a company to take advantage of this service, as opposed to just to it's different on how they're doing it. For, for Indeed, it's not an extra service. They spend their money by uh, promoting their jobs with the different client services team works with them to make them successful. We believe that they're successful. Our, our, our whole business model is based on we deliver the lowest cost for hire of anyone in every market that we're in. And we believe that when we do that, people will come and book more jobs with us. So we want to charge separate for but their whole industries. Uh, Advertising, recruitment advertising agencies in the US are very, very large business. And they're, they're just like a regular media uh, ad agency. They, they do creative, they do media placement, they do everything. So a large company like Ford Motor Company doesn't do any of this themselves. They have a they have whole company that does, does this for them. Is, the, is that the only business which can be used for the That is how, in almost all markets, we are ultimately judged by our. Uh, it's, so they. they Part of it depends on how sophisticated they are with the data. So we have been, because our focus is on um, a pay for performance model, and we believe that we deliver the best performance, we encourage people to measure. But in different markets, there's, depending on what kind of systems they have. So with a system like yours, I imagine there's a lot of detail that you can get out of that. In other markets where there are not applicant tracking systems, um, we spend a lot of time just helping people figure out how to even measure these questions. So at the, at the highest level of cost per hire, they know what they spend, they know how many hires they made. Mm -hmm. But uh, the most sophisticated of our clients, the ones we were talking to last week, they're the ones that have it tied down all the way through to performance assessments at uh, six months and 12 months. Yeah, that's right. And what is, the, what is, what is the, the largest sort of quality overall that they're getting? Uh, they ask this one, one company that we were talking to has two different questions they ask. One is they, um, they just ask the hiring manager straight up, uh, at, at 90 days and at 180 days, um, did we make the right decision hiring this person? And then what is their actual performance assessment? And they use that to measure all of the, the different systems. Uh, unfortunately, it's a very small percentage of companies that are able to measure all of the numbers and how, how good the quality is. So most of them are looking at the quality of, of applicants and how many hires they have. Yeah, because quality is arguably more important. Absolutely, absolutely. Karen, do you, just following on from Chris's point, do you see much in that regard as well? In terms of the kind of post-hire analysis that, that they're doing, is that something that you see in the world? Yeah, and I, I think it's, I think what Chris said is absolutely spot on. It's got to be about return on investment, not about, you know, the old cost thing. But if you're, 
if you're getting 100 candidates and it just costs you an enormous amount to screen and get through the your treatment. But if you're getting fewer and they're successful, then I think again, coming back to the data, it's about well then how are you, where are you, and how are you going about getting these people because they're the ones that you've got this kind of thing. Now, getting back to the job seeker, we guess we kind of covered a lot of this earlier, actually, I think, in the kind of first part of the day. We've talked a bit about the you know, direction of job seekers, and we've talked a bit about, you know, we just mentioned that, you know, a, a lot of searches they did, just location, nothing else. That indicates to me you've got a panel pool of candidates looking for a job, and they quite know what they want. You know, we've talked about, you know, some ideas for Christmas and how to address that. How else do you think we can really kind of address that situation, give people some more um, substance around their job search to kind of maybe just let them get a bit more focused in their search to find the right job or a job that might work for them? To anybody? Okay, no, I was joking. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe I'll frame it frame another way. In, in, is there a lot of value in investing and as organisations, I guess, to really kind of target those job seekers, invest heavily, and is there kind of value for the employer to really kind of educate and help those guys decide? You almost make them decide the job with your organisations, the job with them. Yeah. Can I, I'm going to ask a question to answer your question. Okay. Do you think, does anybody think, that if you are, if you have had some success for, let's just say, a particular job type in a particular area and the way you've gone about it is producing great results, does it then not become more about how you are tactically going about it than purely the content that you are putting out there in your ads for candidates? So you mean in terms of have you found a sweet spot in, a, in an area that you kind of didn't recognise was giving you great candidates, and are you getting more strategic around that? I think, but I but I would say across <coughs> every role of the organisation, so not just you've managed to luck in in this particular area, because I personally am not sure that that's true, but that you've identified that um, I don't know engineers, if you go to this particular area and you're recruiting in this particular fashion, that you get a great outcome, and then for your IT people, you do something. Because I, I just, I don't know, I still come back to this post and pray. It's like you can post this out there and get as many candidates as you possibly can, but then you've got your risk of success of actually finding the right one in that massive big bucket. I don't know, that's <coughs> a good country when you bring that up. So you're talking about going to India, so if you're IT workers, is that, are you talking about countries or locations as in geographic? All of them. And I do think, that's a good point, thank you for saying that, because globally now we know that, um, you know, particularly in the education sector, you have to go globally, yeah. right? So, mm -hmm. Okay, so in terms of, I guess, one of the things that might be an enabler for these job seekers to kind of get, get what they want, certainly search. We talked about mobile, we talked about social. Let's think about search. I mean, if we talk about TripAdvisor, people, it's fair to say, I think we're going to agree, we typically turn to search for most stuff, you know, whether it be a vocation or a insurance or whatever it might be, or even a job now, we see job seekers not default to traditional vertical job sites, either other job boards that are out there sometimes. They might go to a search engine, they might go to an aggregation site for more um, content. I mean, how do you think search is going to really help enable, uh, or how can we utilise search better to get the right job seekers um, coming to organisation? We talk post and pray, forget that for a minute, and yeah. think about search. Maybe I'll try it for Chris. So for us, I mean, I think from the, the data perspective, having access to every search term is an indication of uh, another dimension of what someone's looking for. And so there's a lot of things that job seekers look for that are not just pure job title or skill. And we're able, obviously we're in a different situation than the individual employer, is that for a job seeker, we can see the collection of all those things. What's everything that's on their resume? But what are all the different things that they've been looking for? And we can develop a sort of program to do, which is frankly the same thing that we do with employers when they're searching. I think that um, you know the interesting thing about this, people, large collection of people don't know what they're looking for. That, that works on both sides. So you were basically touching on this. A lot of employers have no idea what 
or where a good candidate for an individual job is. So again, the most sophisticated ones might be able to look at this data and look back and say, well, here's the three universities that came from, here's the number of years of experience, here's what their disposition is. But every survey, piece of research, I would be curious if you see the same thing. Everything that I've ever heard is that uh, your, your background and your skills match is less than half of you are fit for a job, and it's all of the sort of cultural, interpersonal, the things that assessments and some of those other tools try to, try to get at. Um, and so for us, uh, being able to tap into all that data to help understand where there might be a fit that someone doesn't know exists. Um, to tie this into the previous question, I think this is a really interesting thing when you look at the sort of the volume of applications that these large companies get from our customers. We were talking to you about six months ago, a very large, uh, Global consumer brands. They get about 10 million job applications a year for 100,000 positions. And um, so, number one, there's a filtering problem that is just staggering, and they actually outsource all of their front end uh, resume filtering to a company in the Philippines, uh, which means that there's no one from an organization who's even looking at most of those. Now, the other thing they find, and this is I think true for almost every large consumer brand, those 10 million people are their customers as well. And 10 million is actually a significant number of customers, so the experience of applying for the job, they have to ensure that those people actually have a good experience, that they hear back in a timely fashion. Most of them are going to be disappointed and not get that job. Um, they need to be able to ensure that they're not making bad decisions along the way and retain those people who are, frankly, not just customers, they might be some of their better customers because they want to go. There is some interesting research on that. I was talking to my students about this last semester where, for one, a new graduate, uh, and they did some research on this, there's like six individuals that would, would actually hear about that. You know, so the family and friends had a really bad experience being recruited by a uh, health school or whatever, and that you know, the sort of the effect of that really is that six fold, you know, the, the, the network of friends that you have. And if they're, you know, highly networked like you are, um, you know, that's the sort of cohort that your information is really right. So for us, I think that the data becomes, frankly, when you're thinking about a 10 million resume problem, it can only be solved with data. What becomes really important for us, though, is keeping the human element. Mm -hmm. Because what you don't want is some big brother like algorithm deciding you're a bad fit, you're a good fit. Mm -hmm. um, what are the words? I, sorry? No, 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 what are the words you use? What are, you know, you said you had particular words, but because presumably you had a, a, a software to identify a word or a phrase. In terms of what people are searching for. You say you're, you're, you're trying to get a good fit scan and then you filter the applicants. Yeah, so again, what we, what we look at is um, the, the other side, so we have for our small businesses um, who can post jobs. So for most of the jobs on the we're crossing 200,000 million sites to open jobs from everyone. When someone clicks on that job, they go to a new site and find that. But we have for small businesses, they can post jobs directly from the for free and they can actually manage the entire process. They can respond to candidates in a positive or negative way, they can disposition to small businesses in So we actually have for a Several million job seekers uh, every single month. A full life cycle of data for us. Their resume is also related to what job they actually got and they're hired from. And so we can now have all models of employers who look at those resumes to give them a sense of which are, and this is where the, the human element comes in. So what we don't want to do is automatically you know, think of it like an you know, email spam filter and we're rejecting candidates. Um, that would be a nice thing, but unless you can do that perfectly, that's, that's more dangerous. So we're focused right now on. Helping to highlight which ones we think are the best fits. And we've seen a tremendous increase in those employers' usage of being able to reach out to those candidates as soon as they uh, as soon as they apply for those jobs. We want to get them ten million coming in, we want to make sure that you're seeing the right ones first. So we think that taking data and putting it in the hands of people is frankly the best way to do it. You don't want some this faceless thing making decisions about you, but empowering people who don't have access to that data with data to make better decisions is a really thing that because ultimately the hiring manager is, they're humans, they have to be able to, to make decisions as well. You talked about the machine, that, uh, the big brother machine, the size of whether you're good to have this, you know, good to this job or that job, I mean, even the sorting hat can carry quite a <laughs> So if you had one of those, that would be great. That seems to be right all the time. He's a nice personality, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, that's a good, yeah. it's not necessary. Yeah. And you don't want to dehumanize things. So what you were just saying then was that the companies are, you're, you're enabling, People who put in a resume, not just to put in a resume to say how much they want, but they're able to then have a number of different companies that maybe they didn't put a resume to say, hey, you just put a resume. 
So this this person, you know, you send it like I don't want to get all this stuff here. And it's that your software is enabled that. Right, so it's, 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 it's normally it's your iPhone job, you don't hear from other from other companies on Seek or somewhere else. So if you if you enable that, I mean it's data can't fly very well. Right, so we have we have thirty five million resumes, um, nine million just in the last six months where inquiries have come in search. So we have search on both sides, job seekers can search for jobs, employers can search for employees. You have to tick a box to say I want to be contacted by people I haven't contacted. Correct. Yeah, so they, they have to basically upload the resume and say, please make this searchable for, for other employers. The way we do it, though, is from the perspective of our, our whole philosophy has been to put the job seekers first. And so we really think about their needs. Ultimately, we think that the best job seeker experience is going to be good for employers because that will be the place that attracts the most job seekers. So their, their personal information, their, their email address, their telephone number, their address, those are all kind of like private. <coughs> Excuse me, until they choose to share it with employees. So employers can contact them and say, I like your resume, will you please share your information? Let's say there are any employers, you know, check to see if there are any employees. <laughs> we've actually heard, uh, we've, 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 we've heard. Because they want to check their loyalty at this time. Right, so they're not, you know, each other's side of the toes and they'll take their We've actually heard a couple of interesting stories of people posting their resume and then their employer finding out about it and they get a raise as a result. We <laughs> <laughs> go both ways. Well, I mean, that, better to be a raise than a yeah, new job. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Would this not be where that data comes in though? Because obviously we're not just speaking to job seekers, we're seeing actually what they're doing, what they're looking for, you know, how they're using the service and you know using that information. And I think, you know, I think we've clearly identified there's tremendous value in, in the data itself. Do you think that organizations locally here in Australia are actually doing anything with it? I mean that's that's the question I have now, I guess. And probably more so for Maybe Karen, but also I think in terms of behaviour in place as well, and, and, and the soft skills and the other stuff that you know, organisations are now kind of 
between a harness and terms of information, how are they using that to, to do better? I think it's a real challenge. And I, I think for HR, the biggest challenge they face is getting the time to get out of the transaction, to start to understand what data they need to be looking at and what to do with that data to improve organisational performance. And to get to that point to be able to get the exec to commit funds to that. And it's chicken and egg for me. It's, it's not time, it's really, because it's where you're directing the time. Oh, it's I mean, I suppose I don't know. Yeah, I mean, on the place of it, it's resources and time. But it's about rethinking the way you use the time. So if, if you're, if you're, so many of our customers, their HR team is the recruitment team. Mm -hmm. And the focus is completely, well, I shouldn't say completely, 90% on external clients. You've got a vacancy, you go external. That's just what you do. And I find it interesting how they, they can't stop because they've got to fill the roles, right? We all want the roles filled. But they almost do need to shift their thinking to be able to say to the exec, we have to understand our workforce plan and what we have before we recruit externally every single time. But how do they stop doing the recruitment to be able to shift their thinking? Yeah. It's just, a, I, th I think it's a real challenge. Right? And I think it takes, I mean, it's about the legitimacy of HR, I suppose, number one, and people's faces. Sometimes they don't get a lot of legitimacy in the But it's about HR. What they tend to do well is, is measure the efficiencies like the you know, real cost of time. Yep. But they don't do the effectiveness of the impact, which yep. is like, well, okay, we've got the data there, some of them are doing it. And I'm not 100% convinced that it's just because I just think it's the way the organisations, they think it's easier. Do it that way, but in the long run, it's a fucking task, because then they've got to recruit and they've got to recruit more or think about that more because they haven't actually done their 100 day, 180 day, yep. you know, performance assessment of the, you know, so yep. I, I accept that it's. What most people articulate is the problem that they have to do because I think it's really about how you can help them. And that needs, that requires legitimacy from the exec team. Yeah. So yeah. it's sort of part of the problem. And I think you get a, a great HRD who really knows their stuff that can shift the executive thinking and stop saying, you know, there's a cost to this. I need money for this. It's like, it's not a cost, it is return on investment in what you need to do to support the organisation. So. Yeah. I, I think it's a fascinating topic. I, I, we need another dinner. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so it's really a big topic. I think, I think on the whole, we're saying no. Companies yeah. have, haven't really hired the date they've got right now. <clears throat> but we also talked about you know HR departments, you know, you know, the talent acquisition teams within organisations and this data. Is it not time to start to bring different parts of those businesses into that whole data piece? Um, for one, and, it has, and the flip, of the flip side of that is with the data that the recruitment and HR teams have been useful to other parts of their business too, and how can other parts of the organisation use that data to drive, you know, for the better of their business? Oh, hugely, hugely valuable. But I think it comes back to your people data, in my opinion, should not be looked at in isolation across any of the gamut of, you know, as I point, you're looking at the performance of your people and then looking at your performance get recruitment and all of that, it's, it has to link. And, and I think particularly for, you know, we, Australia has the lowest engagement of people globally, was um, in a Gallup survey, but we continually... What's the, what's that engagement? Uh, in the world, and I think really? there's, there's that sort of active engagement, and then there's active engagement, which is where employees are actually doing the right thing by business Employees. Employees doing the wrong thing by business on purpose. And the percent of the study. Yeah, and yeah, we yeah, continually, you know, part of engagement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> but we have to surely look at if any employee in a business wants to talk about where they want to go, they want to talk about how they're performing, where they need development. And I'm not saying there's no role for recruitment there. Absolutely there is. <coughs> but I don't think it should be the first thing to do every single time. But I mean, we always look at recruitment as being something where you just get a bum on the seat. Yeah. And that's not what no. you're, you're recruiting six months after you're recruiting for four promotions. You're, like, it's a life cycle thing. Recruitment goes on for you know, yeah. the year, not just getting the thing in there. I think there's this other ch challenge I can tell, which is that in academia and in technology, we tend to 
live and breathe data. We're bought in completely. We believe in the validity of it. Uh, that's, that's not. Why you have a great team. And that's, <laughs> the trick is that's not universal. And part of so we definitely see large companies sometimes they just they don't have the tools, they don't have the facility. But data is. I mean, if you if you want to be sort of philosophical about it, data is the truth. There's a lot of people who are threatened by that. And we have to be conscious of the fact that we're going into organizations. When you expose the light of here's what the data is, you'll find a lot of things that are um, could look like people are not doing their job. We've wasted a huge amount of money here. Eighty percent of our marketing spend is totally wasted. Eighty percent of our recruitment marketing spend is totally wasted. And there's a lot of people whose first response is, I don't necessarily want everyone to be able to, to see that. Um, you know, again, we come from a very data-driven culture. We test and measure every single new idea that goes into our product. I have, I have empirical data that says that 70% of the ideas of people on my team are wrong. Um, and that's great because we can measure them and we just don't do those. And the 30% that are good and right are the ones that we do. But that requires a culture that embraces that. You go and sh if you went to a, you know, a major global 1,000 company and told them that 70% of what their employees are doing is wrong, a lot of people would get fired. Yeah, and so it's, it's meaningless but without a context or, right. or why, you know, what, what's the what's the underlying reason behind it. So data can mean different things to different people. And getting the data is fantastic, but you need somebody to work with around what that data actually is telling you. Because it could be 70%, you know, it could be some interpersonal relationships that I'm working in team by team program. It could be a million reasons why 70% of that organization's failing. <coughs> so the data's great, but you know, what does it actually mean is where you need to get some Analysis. I mean, I tell all my HR students go and do business analytics because you all need to know how to work around data. If you can't, then you outsource it to somebody who can so you can, you know, make sense of what that means. You need the data, but you also need to be able to analyze it. And that's, I know that's not necessarily what your expertise might be, but you need to buy that in somehow. I'm not a data person, I see numbers in my eyes later. Well. But I'm, I'm okay trying to think about what it actually means, what it could lead to, and I suppose that's why they serious. That's why we do need to work together. That's why the tech people do need to talk to the HR people. That's why we all need to be comfortable with the language that's being used in those areas to help them to work together on fixing and taking some over at the end. So yeah, that's great. So on that note then, we, we talked about you know, a, lot of, a lot of data stuff and obviously in terms of you know, confronting data as well and the importance of that data and the importance of human beings and people. Yeah, beyond the bubble of sea. Do we then think that HR and your recruitment gets a big enough voice in the boardroom? Should there be more, you know, and a bigger board Should I do this? I don't know. Should it be more HR? I can't. So that it, is that a problem? And should it be, you know, should it be higher up the food chain if you like it is? But I think it's, and yes, I agree categorically, but it's back to that chicken and the egg for me. So how do you get yourself a seat at that table? You've got to prove your worth around that table. So without the data and understanding of that data and being able to present information that is meaningful about the impact of HR strategy on business performance, I think it's a struggle. If the exec sees HR as a recruiter or an administrative person, how on earth do they shift that without being able to understand the data? Well, well, and that's the trick is HR is one of those functions where if they're doing a good job, nobody knows. Yeah. It's only when there's not enough people or there's too many people who are doing a terrible job when everyone starts looking at the HR team. Yeah. It's seen as Which is crazy because it's so hard. It's all about your people. Yeah. Is, that, is that changing? Well, it depends on the organisation, doesn't it? Yeah, look, I, I think it is. I do see in our customer base that that is changing. And I think it's it's a good journey to get there, but I, I do see you know some some great things happening from HR that that is just so critical. But we have customers who there isn't actually a HR banner; they've got you know, all development, then they've got recruitment, and they might report to different people, so there's no umbrella. So there's no chief recruitment officer at very uh, there might be, but there might not be a chief HR officer that sits over all the people. Yeah. So, you know, you're looking at recruitment, but you're not looking at recruitment in light of everything else that's going on with your people. Well, that's actually, in that instance, I'm talking about your job. Oh, HR. Just to add, 
Yeah. 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 Y
pack up till it's dirty. Yeah, but it's just a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a job seekers there, we talked a lot about organizations using data. Now, what data do you think job seekers, you know, we all speak to a lot of people, but job seekers, what are they most likely to want to have access to? Um, I mean, we know what they've got, we've kind of talked about some of the stuff they're doing. What do you think they really want at their fingertips that's going to help them make a great decision or get that perfect job? I think they're looking for an organisation that will provide opportunities in terms of training and a career and maybe mobility sometimes, although you mentioned that maybe not. So they, I think they want challenges, most, most applicants. Um, I think they want to know a lot of culture and organisations like them at the start, because they don't think there's no choice. Um, they work on their wages, that's usually pretty up front, on the things that probably do. You can find that they answer on that. Um, they might, some of them might, they talk about it, whether they do and the reality hits and they look at the wage, but they say they want work like balance. <coughs> well, I don't know. I think they do. I think they probably mean by that they have to go to a you know, rave party over the side of the world or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that's what my daughter thinks. I was just a representative. Um, but you know, it's that it's that thing about flexibility, being able to pop in and out of the organisation. Um, so you think so people want the, the the role, the job to kind of work to them? Yeah, absolutely. As opposed to them kind of picking it. Oh yeah. No, I think most people uh, are quite the generation. You know, the old, when I was growing up, was, they would ask, you know, how would you contribute to the organisation by this time or something. Now it's the other way around. And, yeah, and ask the organisation, what are you going to do for me? Is what's a promotion in the next year? So, yeah. I ask not what you can do for the organisation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, is, right. is that consistent across jurisdictions? Because that seems like a 24 years without a recession kind of attitude as opposed to reality. what's just gone on in the US and Spain and yeah, that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's different generationally and it's different in different countries. So if you look at just the one, like to boil things down to one number, uh, the average turnover in the US today in Bureau of Labor Statistics is 4.6 years is the average tenure that uh, a job seeker, uh, sorry, an uh, employee in the US stays in their job. In, in Japan, it's 20 years. In Germany, it's 15 years. Uh, now, the US, and not necessarily, my, my parents are, are sort of baby boom, but them and, and slightly older, it would have been 20, 25 years in the yeah, US. Yeah. That, you know, it used to be we go to work at IBM or you know, uh, Procter & Gamble, and that would be your job for life. Yeah. Um, when you look at all the research on the millennial side, like 17 is 18 years old, and, and every bit of research that you see is that kids that age believe that they're going to have 10 to 15 jobs in their lifetime. Yeah. So none of them seem to be looking for a career in the same way that we think. Well, they're not looking for, for an organizational career. Right. They're, looking for, they're looking for a set of experiences yeah. where what they're doing, they're not looking for advancement within the individual organization. And that used to be very important. And in Japan, it still is incredibly important. So in Japan, the average Japanese worker has two jobs. A job when they're getting out of college, they get hired as a new grad, and pretty much every employer in the entire country has a single job posting. It's called new grad, and it doesn't matter if you have a philosophy degree or an electrical engineering degree. You get hired as a new grad because they have 20 years to figure out what to do. Um, and then somewhere in your mid-career, it's called mid-career, you look for uh, a new job, and it's like buying a house. It's a considered decision where in the U.S. people are applying for jobs. I mean, we we see people get a job on Indeed and they still keep their job alerts and they're still looking at jobs and applying jobs you know, a month or two afterwards because they're just keeping their so options open. So, so that's very, very different. What is it here? What is it? What's the statistic here? So I actually don't. I need to. I need to pull so that one. Just get that statistic. I'd like to get that, and yeah. I know Amy agrees as well. Yeah. Yeah. And give that to these guys. So I think that's yeah. We can. We can definitely get that. that. I mean, it's, it's sure. Really yeah. It's, it's, in those countries, it's readily available. Yeah. Sure can, I just want to beat America. I need to play myself. So we're also. Yeah. Just because I have a mark for you know, in the US. Yeah. So the the other thing that's very different is the generation. Yeah. in terms of what people who are in their you know, 18 to 28 yeah. are looking for. We have, what is the next, uh, uh, I don't know, before we go. Okay, so we, we, have, uh, we have all this amazing data. We actually, about a year ago, hired uh, uh, in the US a labor economist, a uh, woman named Tara Sinclair. She's a, a professor at George Washington University. And we basically opened up all of our data to her, and she and her 
the team have been doing real academic research given the demand side of the data. So the, the, the government and other people and uh, academics traditionally have had great access to the supply side and the demand side. Yeah. We haven't had the CDP on it. Yeah. Yes, and so once a quarter she's been, she, she basically does blog posts, usually once a month, and then every quarter there's a, an actual big academic research project that she, she does. Um, the last quarter, which would be interesting, we could definitely share with you, uh, was about global mobility. So we basically looked at country by country around the world, uh, across a couple different dimensions, which countries were most people outside of the country searching new because they wanted to move to, which countries were most people within the country looking to potentially leave by searching out of there, um, and then how much competition within the market. So in certain markets, how many people coming from outside of that market were competing with the local top secrets competing with. Um, and in the US, we work with them state by state. The next one that she's doing is looking at basically three generations of um, millennials, Gen X, and baby boomers, and in particular, what types of qualities for jobs they're looking for, what types of jobs, how frequently they're searching, all of those things. So that's something after seven or 15, and we can definitely give you one. Uh, the, those reports, yeah. they're on our, our, our website, okay. on, the, on the blog, but we can share them. Yeah, no, I'd like to have them. We'll the, 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 the first one she did was really interesting also, was looking within uh, individual job categories, how many people were searching outside of their own job category, okay. which ones were people looking to, to move into. So it's, it, it's a really interesting yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 That's what you're looking Towards to kind of really you know, better understand the future of hiring and recruitment, and what and what changes do we think we're going to see, and what would we maybe hope to see? If anyone else wants a copy, some tea. Good time with coffee,
present government seems to think that this issue just makes it already. Long term. Long term. Long I think certainly if I try and make it a good hands on to get an extra to think about it. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of an idea of the sort of dream of what we could do. The reality is it's probably going to be very different, but there's an aspiration there of yeah. what we could do. Um, so I think kids don't give themselves a good any reading space. They go straight from school to university. I feel like I'm dealing with I'm trying to unpack, unpack them just to sort of strip them back and just think about what they actually are good at, what they like to do, what they would like to see their life unfold. There's so much pressure for parents and everybody. You've got to achieve, 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 you know, make money and all these things. You just really are quite awesome. So I sort of try and hose them down a bit and sort of think, think, about, think about their life being something they actually should enjoy. Um, so I, I, I'm pro at the postgrad level, they're better. I can probably talk much more sensibly because they've done their undergrad, they've got a bit of experience out in the workplace, they know some stuff out there, and they're sort of trying to think about, and that's where I probably can do a bit more work around thinking about what their skills are, identify where they can go. It's not always up, it might be you know, a long, um, but undergrads, it's a bit different because they're too young. They don't know what the hell's going on. They're recovering from the HSC and they're still probably, you know, trying to find out a few other things. You know what I mean? It's sort of so yeah, I take that role on, but probably more from a counselling career point of view with post grad students in my So education is the future, what else? What people say that just near enough to the thought too, I get to that um, practitioner directors of HR friends say universities, you know, sorry, right, the university's actually not going to get you anywhere. What's going to get you is whatever you know, university is like 20% or you wouldn't have 20% most, so most, 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 people, <laughs> most people don't end up working in the field that they still no, end up but, but they still and use university as a, a, as a way of critically engaging. Right, no, but I'm saying, so I'm, I'm a technology guy, yeah. you would think, um, is, is sort of my, my focus. My undergraduate degree is history and theory of architecture. Yeah. And the, what I tell people, people always ask, you know, what's the most important skill? The single most important skill that I have in my job is writing and reading English oh, prose. Yeah. No, English prose, writing sentences, is the single most important thing that I do. And if I didn't have a broad liberal arts undergraduate education, I would be very yeah. useless at my job. Yeah, yeah. And I mm -hmm. learned everything that I needed to in, in graduate school. But that's also a luxury in a lot so of people. So where did the IT come in? Just the jobs you've had? And you've run I, I, I went back to school five years. I mean, I taught in public high school for two years. I played music professionally for three years, and then I went back to grad school and got a master's. Yeah. yeah, the master, that's where you really start doing right. what you want to do, and that's the way our sector's going anyway. But we, yeah. we, so we, hire, we hire guys who are you know, yeah. engineers who've been writing code since they were five years old, and so it's a, that, it's a different world. But I think it's also impossible to say that the jobs of the future, there's very few universities right now that are teaching courses that are going to be relevant for what jobs are going to look like 15 well, years. 15 years ago, no that's why you shouldn't. Right, so. Mm -hmm. I, but there's big things like each. So 
the other thing, that, and you mentioned this a, a while earlier back, but um, we had a conversation for, um, before this all started about Uber. So Uber, to me, is a really fascinating company. Um, number one, because they're hiring like crazy, so we actually see a lot of data about just how many people uh, are working there. But I've been a customer for the last four years, and I talk to every single driver because I'm most curious about this. And what I've seen, especially four years ago, all the drivers were people who were professional drivers who were looking for not having to, to work for the company that you've worked for for 20 years and you've worked for a particular hours. The last dozen drivers that I've had on one of them has actually been a driver before. And I know that there's some controversy here because of the Uber X is illegal currently in Australia. Um, but in all the other markets that they're in, they've sort of tapped into this market on the driver side, very different than on the consumer side. And as a rider, it's, it's a great service for people who are just looking for more flexibility. CPA and has been working in the field for 20 years. She's got a special needs son. She's a single parent, uh, a certified public accountant. So she's a she's a she's an accountant, but she basically needed to be able to be flexible to pick up her son and take him to appointments. And Uber, she's making a little less money, but she can name her own hours. And there's something about the driving which is it's dignified with work that it's a, a large swath of the workforce is willing to do it. it requires no training. Everyone can drive the car. And, and it suddenly has created this entire market. I've had six software engineers in the last two months who are my Uber drivers who are working at a startup where they're not making as much money as they used to, or one guy has a wife who's back in graduate school, and you can just pick up shifts whenever you want. They've got their surge pricing, so you can only drive during certain hours and make more money. Um, and then I have friends who are full-time drivers on Uber. So, they, and so I think that that's one particular thing, but I think there will definitely be a lot more of the need for flexibility which I, I, th I think it's an, and I don't think they've set out to do that, but they've tapped into this what is clearly a huge need. And if you can provide, you know, meaningful work that uh, pretty much you know you have control over when you can do it and you can make a fair wage, yeah. there's a huge opportunity for that. Let's say you're not focused on how you work as an right. around. Let's say you're not having because they have in their in their work. They're not traveling long because they're outside. It's on their own clock in a sense, you know. And it pays well because it's a job that a lot of people don't want. Well, you want to do it. That's right. Stick with it. So, sort of the actual flexibility, I suppose, is what you want. I think internal flexibility as well, though. Like more and more about people don't want to come in at 8 30 in the market. They want to be able to be trusted. And for someone at my age, that was hard at first to think. No, no, no. Like, yeah, you know, it's not just working from home. So, I think we all have to shift. Right. Well, and that's where technology, though, Uber would yeah. not exist without a mobile device that sits in my pocket yeah. as a rider and in the car, yeah. where it's, it's really is on, it's on demand, task by task hiring. Yeah. I mean, that's it, the taxi time. Right. Mm -hmm. I think getting rid of the job after has, has not been done. Yeah. So, it's like, like really they're all, you know, know Russian. <laughs> Can I ask a, a, an off topic on, on a question? Um, the ADF just got one and a half percent pay rise. Um, one and a half percent pay rise, um, uh, wages are growing two percent. I just didn't use. Morris Newman yesterday. I have a, an angle that I can see coming is that Australians over the next 10 years basically get no pay rise. How is the HR industry going to handle that communication? Because we become uncompetitive as a nation, and so at best we'll get flat. Yep. And at worst, people will see wages fall because either the economy will cause it, they'll lose their jobs, or um, they'll have to reapply for their jobs a lower low wage. So how does the HR industry handle that? I think that's, um, I think it's tough. I think we're, we're seeing a bit of that now in um, a lot of companies, no blanket, you know, CPI increase, for example, talking about top performers and the challenge of that kind of communication in an organisation where you're trying to engage your workforce, if you've got to call 80% of them, you really value, but 20% of your rise and you're not going to I don't, I don't know the answer. I think it's, it's, it's tough. Development. Like reduced hours. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you know I, I think there, there is that, but I think 
it's it's that tough message of there's top performance that everyone says you have to keep and it makes sense, right? But yeah. then that doesn't mean you don't go with the other 80 odd percent. But how do you deliver? I don't know how I hear a message it's like that. Be honest. Oh, yeah, yeah, but you know, know it's, 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 that's how we do it. I don't think it's right in the last one. We've got to be the US, we've got to be Europe, we missed um, global levels in certain circles, and that's it. That's why it's just a big cozy hole on this fantastic way. <laughs> With all we've been saying, you know, here in a few years, oh, it's going to, you know, and it is going to, but I think it's going to get a little bit of a. But in terms of Greg's question, I, mean, my, I suppose my question would be so are they just going to suck up the fact they're not going to get a pay rise? Mm -hmm. Or no, are other trade wars that are going to more important than yeah. they're going to be enough? No, but like, what I was sort of getting to was that if it's across the board, if the economy is flattening, flattening, then it's not just, you know, you're getting the pay cut, it's like the economy is getting paid. All workers. Yeah. But it's not taken as a personal thing, but as a look, this is a real sort of readjustment from the relatively good standards of living we've had over the last decade. So it may, maybe that softens the blow, but I don't know. Can you talk about pay being a third or fourth order issue for most people? I know. It's funny. I mean, once it's off the table, really flexibility and all those things actually become really important. So, okay, we do care about money because it's a bit of an ego thing and we get paid for money, pay more than you, or you get paid more than you are. But I think ultimately most of us just want to interest in jobs. As long as we can pay the It comes back down to your point about assessing what you've got. And not just in terms of capability, but okay, if, if we unpack everybody again and say, build your ideal role, what elements do you make that? The summit will agree with flexibility, the summit will be okay. The ones that fall into that pay category are the ones that you know, we have to incentivize in that way. Three of those uh, 
uh, we're yeah. not prepared for it. We have that in mind, so you know, these kids oh. making them locked up. You know, if there's a fly and fly out, that's going to crumble soon. Yeah. You know, how do you get used to it running a mega like mm -hmm. when you've been doing 250 a year? <laughs> so it's going to be hard for them. Time will tell, we're going to see. Um, I think that pretty much completes our time for today. Uh, what I would say is that um, there's a couple of things I think we can go and get that Gallup research I'm interested in. Who mentioned Gallup research? I can check. Really interested in seeing that and sharing that as well. In terms of the labour mobility stuff that Tara Sinclair did, we're going to make sure you guys um, are going to have that shared. We've got some more stuff coming out, which again we'll reach out to you guys as well. Is there anything from study that you want a clarification on? Um, let us know. And we'll be happy to provide that information for you. I've got six um, or seven things. Super. Right.